The sculpture collection at Wentworth Woodhouse is largely a survivor from the time of the second Marquis of Rockingham, who assembled the collection in the mid 18th century. It's not complete, as many of the statues were moved or sold in the mid 20th century, but what remains is still impressive. The collection is a mixture of genuine antiquities, 18th and 19th century marble copies of antique sculpture, and plaster casts of famous pieces from other collections. There are statues of Greek and Roman gods, goddesses, heroes, and leaders. And there is one damaged but very fine statue of a young man called Antinous. Antinous wasn't a leader or a hero, and he didn't arrive on the scene as a god. He came from Bithynia in modern day Turkey. He was a favorite and it's believed the lover of the Roman Emperor Hadrian. He died by drowning in mysterious circumstances in Egypt before his 20th birthday in 130 AD. On learning of his death, Emperor Hadrian was distraught. One historical record mentions that he is said to have wept like a woman. Now, although Hadrian's relationship with Antinous wouldn't have been in the least bit remarkable to Roman elite society, this open display of affection and grief for Antinous after his death would have been astonishing. And it didn't end with Emperor Hadrian's tears. Hadrian established a city in Egypt called Antinoopolis, literally City of Antinous, close to the site where his lover had died, and he also declared Antinous a god. This was an extraordinary act at the time. Deification was normally reserved for emperors, or occasionally members of the imperial family. Dozens of statues of Antinous were commissioned across the empire, including many for Hadrian's own villa at Tivoli. Temples were erected to him and commemorative coins were minted. Of all the statuary that has survived from the Roman era into modern times, those identifying as representing Antinous are among the most common. About 100 contemporary statues of him are known to us today. In addition to the life-size statue at Wentworth Woodhouse, bought by the second Marquis in 1751, and originally displayed in the Marble Saloon, there is also a bust of Antinous on the main staircase. This is a genuine antiquity, and was bought at auction in 1755. And, there's a plaster plaque of Antinous in the West Entrance Hall, which was purchased in 1773. This is a copy of a much celebrated representation of Antinous, which the Marquis would have seen in Rome. And, in a photograph dating from 1924, the plaque is looking down at a bust of the Emperor Hadrian, this makes Antinous the most represented individual character in all of the sculptures that remain at Wentworth Woodhouse. But why? What was the 18th century fascination with this young man from antiquity? And why did the second Marquis acquire so many representations of him? To understand this, we need to comprehend the huge importance of ancient Greek and Roman civilizations to the aristocratic society of the Georgian era. In architecture, literature, fashion, art and decoration, all things Greek and Roman were deemed to be in the best possible taste. Being seen to embrace this, and being surrounded by representations that hinted back to classical civilizations, displayed the owner's levels of sophistication to an inquisitive and often quite judgmental world. Making the right impression was all important. The incredible East Front at Wentworth Woodhouse is absolutely covered with classical references from its Palladian and neoclassical architecture to the choice of statuary which adorns the roof. It's a colossal statement of the wealth, education and good taste of an elite Georgian male. The interiors of the house are also filled with nods towards the classical past. The plaster statues in the pillared hall are copies of statues which can be found in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. Their presence at Wentworth Woodhouse was intended to give the impression of being in Florence itself. It didn't matter that the Marquis only had copies, he was making a statement even with these. Of course, if genuine antiquities could be acquired, so much the better. Even if these had been restored, such as the bust of Antinous here on the main staircase. And if you couldn't find an original, but you had the financial resources behind you, then marble copies of the real thing were perfectly acceptable, as we can see here in the marble saloon. The second Marquess traveled through Europe in the mid 18th century as part of his grand tour, an essential element in the education of any young nobleman of the Georgian era. At this time, excavations at Pompeii were ongoing, and the city of Herculaneum had only recently been rediscovered, a few years earlier, in 1738. The large female statue that graces our main staircase 
is reputed to have come from here. Just like today, the opinions of certain individuals heavily influence the actions and beliefs of the people in the Georgian era. Lord Burlington, known in his day as the Apollo of the Arts, or Architect Earl, did much to champion the use of Palladian architecture as the correct form for country houses and public buildings in his day. Wentworth Woodhouse is one of the finest examples of this. Johann Winkelmann, a German art historian and archaeologist, was also in Italy in the mid-18th century, and he became known as the father of art history, particularly in relation to Greek art. His publications were hugely influential, in particular, his 1764 publication, The History of Ancient Art. Winkelmann was openly gay and had numerous same-sex relationships during his lifetime. He also lavished praise on the statuary and other representations of Antinous, and his word carried enormous weight amongst the aristocratic elite of his day. In 1767, he described one antique relief of Antinous as the glory and crown of the art of the age, as well as any other. Five years later, the second Marquess acquired his own copy of that relief for the West Front Hall at Wentworth Woodhouse. The sculptor of our statue of Antinous, Bartolomeo Cavicepi, was a close friend and associate of Winkelmann. He was also chief statuary of Historia to the Pope, and the Vatican Museum contains a number of very fine statues of Antinous, as do the collections of noble families and royalty across Europe. So perhaps knowing that the father of art history championed representations of Antinous, and this in turn created a fever amongst his elite contemporaries for acquiring representations of this young man, was enough for the second Marquess of Rockingham to make sure his own sculpture collection was well stocked with depictions of this classical poster boy turned god. Today, we have not uncovered evidence that would suggest any other reason for the second Marquess to collect so many representations of Antinous, beyond a clear desire to be at the forefront of the fashions and accepted ideals of the day. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, Antinous became a gay icon at a time when a same-sex relationship dare not speak its name. He's referenced in two works by Oscar Wilde and by several other authors and playwrights during the 20th century. Even today, his story still engages us. Perhaps, with modern eyes, a relationship between the most powerful man on earth and a teenage boy who had no power at all might be viewed differently. But it seems clear that at the time, the bond between Hadrian and Antinous was a strong one. And the powerful reaction of the emperor to the death of his lover has had an impact that has echoed throughout the ages.